Welcome to Science and Non-Duality. What is non-duality? The universal forces. It's the collective conscious. Being aware. Trauma is not the external event that happens. Trauma is the impact of that event, which is the disconnection from ourselves. That matter is energy. Energy is matter. That's what EMC squared is about. There's a language without nouns. There is a language without subjugation. There's a language without objectifying. But if it's recorded, then we there is a collapse. But if it's not, then it's the infinite potentiality. Welcome back to the Sounds of Sand podcast. This is Michael Riley, wishing you a happy new year to all of our listeners. And thank you for your wonderful feedback on our end of year winter solstice episode entitled Silent Light. And now I present another new conversation for this new year with friend of sand, Katie Gray. Before we begin today's episode, I wanted to talk a bit about how this podcast is produced and how you can support. The production costs of this show are solely supported by our SAND members. And SAND members are a community, and in addition to supporting the mission of science and non-duality, members gain access to the entire library of recorded live SAND events, community gatherings, films, and interviews. It's a collection of over 1,000 recordings available exclusively to SAN members, facilitating your ability to learn, share, expand, and connect with the community. And your support means everything to us. It empowers us to create new programs, films, events, and this podcast. So we invite you to head over to scienceandnonduality.com slash join, or find a link in the show notes about monthly and annual memberships. Okay, let's get into today's episode. Our guest is Katie Gray, and she is an author, singer, producer, counselor, and elder caregiver devoted to helping people connect with feeling, presence, and self-awareness. And as we discuss in today's episode, Katie has hosted a number of sand events and interviews over the years, so you may recognize her voice as we get into our conversation. And she has a brand new book out called The Empowered Heart Guidebook, which is an abridged version of her previous book, Journey of the Empowered Heart. And we discuss the creation of this book, the power of listening and music, her circular map to empowering the heart, the rhythm of transformation on this path, remembering to remember, healing in community, and much more. All today on the Sounds of Sand podcast presented by Science and Non-Duality. Okay, Katie, welcome to the Sounds of Sand podcast. It's so wonderful to have you here today. Thanks for doing this. Oh, Michael, thank you so much. I feel honored and it feels really good to be here. Yeah, so fans of Sand, of Science and Non-Duality may be recognizing your voice right now because you've hosted a number of events over the years, Wisdom in Times of Crisis and Dying and Living and probably others too I haven't listened to yet. So how did you first connect with Sand, with Science and Non-Duality? Well, I actually first connected with uh, Maurizio and Zaya uh, through a conference that I was producing, co-producing up in Washington State called the Imagine Convergence. And that was, it was similar in construct to, to the conference that Sand used to put on every year in California. And we actually brought Maritza and Zaya up as guests, um, as speakers for the event. And I'd never met them. I, I educated myself on who they were before they came. I, didn't, I wasn't too familiar with sand. And then um, they arrived and immediately I recognized them. Like my, my spirit recognized them. I just adored them. And we actually were doing interviews Um, In addition to the main stage and having traditional presenters and speakers, we were doing interviews. And we were looking for someone to interview Maurizio and Zaya. And we were thinking, who would be the perfect person? And, you know, who would be the perfect person to interview these amazing people? And I ended up being the person to interview them. So we sat down in an interview and it was the three of us in a beautiful conversation. I believe it was about relationships and trauma and it was so fluid and so natural. And we got done with the interview and looked at one another and said, okay, what is going on here? Who are you? Who are you? 
And um, we've been very close as friends since then. Um, they actually married my husband and I years ago. Yes. Yeah. And and it was natural to then be a part of Sand, you know, through music, through helping with interviews, et cetera. Um, yeah. So that's how it began. That's my entry point into Sand. Hmm. Very nice. And then they invited you to host conversations uh, online mostly. Yeah, I think it I think because of my history being a counselor and and a therapist helping people work through through their psyche, through trauma, through contemplation, you know, it it allows me to um, weave a conversation to put the pieces together to to help someone um, travel from one topic to another topic, you know, to self-reflect. And yeah. I think it, being an interviewer wasn't something that I would um, have thought of myself as an interviewer, but as a counselor, I love intimate conversation. I love holding space. I love listening. I love going beyond the external layer, the facade, and and going deeper. And it it was natural for me to then be someone who could help um, go deeper, help help us as a collective go deeper into these conversations through through interviewing, you know. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that comes through. So in the, the interviews I've watched that you've conducted, like you you're ver- have a skill at being very transparent. Like you can really let the other person shine through, which I'm in a similar boat. I never would have imagined I'd be an interviewer and it just kind of happened through <laughs> through uh, energies aligning, let's say. Um, but I think it's, you mentioned being a musician too and so much of, of I think being a good interviewer is being a good listener and being able to know when to let someone else shine. Yes, absolutely. I, listening is something that is, oh, honestly, Michael, if we could listen, if we had the ability, we do have the ability. If we knew how important it, it is to listen, you know, to listen to our hearts, to listen to our intuition, to listen to our loved ones, to, to birds, to animals, to trees. You know, it's the ability to listen that I think reconnects us with the all, with, mm-hmm. with great spirit. And for me, I think my listening as a musician really, um, it was really strengthened through um, being in a duet with, with my husband and our band Sea Stars. You know, we, we were both solo musicians, you know, lead singers, and then started a band together, a duet. And when you harmonize with someone, a big part of harmonizing is listening. It's not just matching someone where they're at, but it's listening to where they're at in order to meet them there, you know? And I think to harmonize, even just the essence of of harmonization, you know, what does it mean? It means two parts coming together in sync, meeting one another, resonating, and and that's um, something I learned through years of of harmonizing with my voice. Um, but it's also, it ties into what we're saying, you know, being able to harmonize with the planet, being able to harmonize with someone else, being able to meet them where they're at to listen, and then to find a frequency where it creates something beautiful, you know, where it creates something stronger when those two sounds come together, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, it's a very unique feeling when you harmonize. You know, I'm not a, a skilled singer, but the little bit of harmony singing I've done, it's like you can conceptualize it. Like you can say, okay, I'm supposed to sing a fifth and it should line up like this on the staff. But it's it's a strange feeling because you're, like you said, you're listening and you're sounding at the same time and you have to make space for both. And when you hit that sweet spot of you're in harmony, it just like sends shivers through your body and you're like, okay, this is it. We're in, we're in key. And it's such a ephemeral but powerful state to be in, to be in harmony. Yeah, I, I think that is, I think that frequency that you speak of, those chills, that that frequency, I think that is, there's something there. There's something there as far as an entry point to the possibility of, of greater healing, you know, to to really listen to one another 
and to to join one another with our voices, with our sounds, with our feelings, with our intentions, and to to amplify. You know, I think we are so powerful as individuals, but it is when we come together that that is amplified, that we mirror one another, that we that we create a frequency, we co-create a frequency that is of a higher dimension. It's, it's a higher frequency. It is otherworldly, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think there is something to be said for that, for the potential of, of harmonization, you know? Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Mm-hmm. We're just going to... We're just going to figure out <laughs> the healing of the planet together, you and I, on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, listening is definitely going to be part of it. I don't know if it's the final step, but it's uh, in, in your new book, The Map of the Empowered Heart, I want to get into the the mechanics and the landscape of what you've what you've put forth here. But um, there's definitely, a, it's a, it, it feels very spatial to me. And listening is somehow in that in that alchemy of of what what he, individual and collective healing could look like. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah. Let me know how how where would you like to begin with with that work? Well, well, I, so this is a, a not a sequel, but it's a follow up to a larger book, the the new book at least, the Empowered Heart Guidebook. So, could you talk a bit about the genesis of of why this book wanted to come in to Existence, yeah. Why the, the abridged guidebook. version? Yeah. yeah, the guidebook. Yeah. Well, I, I wrote the original book. Um, it's over four hundred pages. Um, I think it's four hundred and eighteen. Um, and when I wrote that, I originally wrote what is the guidebook. I originally wrote the skeletal structure of of this methodology, a map, an understanding of how we can better understand our trauma and then resolve it. And it is, I think I, I call it a map and a method, you know, a methodology, the empowered heart. But when I originally wrote the book, it was around 200 pages. And I wanted to just tell the reader, you know, I wanted to give them information. I wanted to make it very clear and concise and and explain this process of what's actually going on when we find ourselves in addiction. You know, I had really researched and studied and broken it apart and put it together and realized there's a very natural and and common progression, this circular experience that happens through trauma and, and how it affects us. And when I had given it to my my editor, you know, she wasn't the one who ended up editing the book, but uh, my dear friend Kelly Notoris, she... Um, she took a look at the manuscript, she looked it over and she said, it's amazing. I think you've, you stumbled across something that is transformative and this is a big deal, but where are you? And I, I said, what do you mean? I, what do you mean? Where am I? And she said, where is Katie Gray in this whole book? I, it's information and it's important and it's powerful, but you're not in the book. And she said, I think you need to go back to the drawing board and you need to tell personal stories. You know, she said, if you deliver something to the reader through a personal story, it's 20 times more uh, likely to be absorbed. The information is absorbed much more deeply if you wrap it up in a story. And I said, okay, so you want me to tell stories? Just uh, what kind of stories? And she said, your stories. I want you to tell about your clients. I want you to tell personal stories. And, And she didn't specifically say you should tell your entire story. But but she said, you need to explain how you know what you know. And so I went back to the drawing board and I wrote stories. I told the story of my own trauma and then how that evolved into my own pain, into this pain that I was feeling and then into this need for for resolution and then how that need transpired into a, a hunger and into an addiction with food and then into bulimia. And I realized as I started telling stories, what I was going to do was just tell the reader my story. You know, I think so many times authors, um, therapists, um, they they protect themselves unknowingly by positioning themselves at arm's distance from the reader. You know, I am the authority, and I'm going to 
I'm going to give you information that's going to help you, but we're not going to necessarily talk about me because I'm a therapist. This is your pain. This is your trauma. And I think there's something very safe about doing that. And it felt a little risky um, to tell my story, but it also felt really necessary and very, um, it felt like if I had written a book about the resolution of trauma, then, and I'm talking about the ego and I'm talking about protection, et cetera, then, then I need to tell, I need to, to break down my own comfort zone and just be really, really honest. And, um, adding those stories, Michael made it 400 pages, <laughs> like it doubled mm-hmm. the size of the book and it made this huge book. And, and that's okay. I ended up releasing a very large book, but, but what made it um, troublesome is that it's a lot of information and it's, um, it's going to be a little more challenging to get that information to people if they don't feel inspired to read 400 pages, which personally I wouldn't feel inspired to read a 400 page book if someone handed it to me. I'd say, okay, when I retire, I'm going to have the time to read this book. Um, So this is back to the bones. This is uh, taking out all of the personal stories. There's no personal stories left. And it's just back to the basics so that someone can uh, go through it, better understand it. And if they want to hear personal stories, they can can go to the original version. Mm, Beautiful. Well, the first question I have on that is, how, what was that process of of going back through your personal stories? Was it was it difficult, or did it kind of flow out of you, or was it start starting and stopping a lot? Mm, I think it was actually very cathartic. Mm. I think it felt really good to tell the story. You know, I think um, I I don't feel uh, shame around telling my story. I've, I've told it many times and I actually feel empowered by sharing with people that I had a food addiction for two decades and bulimia for 17 years and that I was had nearly killed myself. I was walking the edge really close and then turned around and changed the trajectory, chose a different path and came out of that darkness and um, figured it out. You know, I had to save my own life. And in doing so, I gained years and years of wisdom and understanding that by the time I had fully recovered um, and I was helping others, it was clear that I had really figured out something profound to be completely healed from addiction and to not be suffering any longer, to not be in pain, to not be hungry. I was hungry since I was a small child and I wasn't hungry anymore because of the work that I had done. Um, When I say hungry, I mean that insatiable hunger that I chose food to satiate it. But for some of us, we choose a cigarette or alcohol. And and it felt really important. It felt bigger than me that I had a, a duty to pass this information on that if I could just map it out and show people what I had learned, maybe it would help them uncoil from their suffering and that's when the imagery started coming these the symbols the stages you know when it became a a visual diagram um which some have compared it to the hero's journey you know to leaving home going out away from self and then going into the dark abyss of suffering and coming back you know it is very circular and Mm -hmm. The intention for writing it was never to build a successful career or make a lot of money or sell a lot lot of copies. I just wanted to have something tangible that would allow someone who didn't feel comfortable enough to um, talk with someone or who didn't have the finances to hire a therapist or didn't have the resources to do a medicine ceremony, you know, Mm. that they they would have support in their hands. They would have the, the ability to heal themselves if if they wanted to through reading the book. Beautiful. And so the the circular map was sort of always a part of of this vision. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, it was it, I think that the circular the shape of the diagram came over time. You know, it it originally started as a a line. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I had mapped out how we end up in a state of suffering. I had 
I knew the stages because at that point I'd started working um, as a counselor, working with other people through their trauma. And I started to see very, very clear similarities. I started to match the pieces that, aha, I, I know where they're at. I've been there. And okay, I know, I know what they're feeling right now. That's, they're in that stage. That's, aha, that's where they are. And, and I started realizing that every time, time and time again, I was finding that we were going through these very specific stages and, and, um, you know, it was phases and stages of suffering. And so I had mapped out, okay, I, I know, you know, where we start is we're just born as these sacred, beautiful, innocent, conscious spirits housed in these bodies. We're all just these tender, beautiful, beloved beings. And then trauma happens and we're just Mm -hmm. struck with this bolt of lightning. And then our hearts are broken and we're hurting. And then we're, at that point, we need help. We need to talk to someone. We need connection. We need comfort. We need love. And most of us don't get our needs met when we've experienced trauma. So we do what what is the best thing we know to do, which is protect ourselves. We try to stay safe by by covering up our hearts, by building this callous tissue around those wounds. And in doing so, we immerse ourselves in the ego. We, we build up this cage and we tell ourselves, I don't care, I'm fine, it's okay, I'll just distract myself. And then if someone gets too close to that tender place within us, we get defensive. If someone says something, we get triggered and, and we want to fight to protect that that painful heart within us. And then we're suffering. We're stuck. We just, we end up addicted and we're lost. We feel disconnected from ourselves, from our families, from a sense of purpose. And, and I knew that much. I knew, okay, I knew how it happened. That's how it happened. Okay, got it. Those are the, the stages. And then when writing the book and realizing I needed to really make a clear map to help bring resolution, we don't, I don't want to just tell people how it happens. We need to how did it happen to then get out for me? Um, I then created the another line, you know, that brought people out of suffering, the stages of, of getting out. Um, and then it turned into a circle. You know, I realized, mm-hmm. wait a second, this is a circle. This is, yeah. it's a circular experience, you know? Yeah. Yeah, like it starts at home in the heart and then you go through all these adventures and then by the time you realize it's over, you're like, wait, I'm still at home. I never really left. I was here the whole time. <laughs> mm, yes, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Because the home, the home is the heart. And I call it mm-hmm. the home, you know? Mm-hmm. The home of who you are is your heart. It's your spirit. It's presence. It's consciousness. It's, it's love. It's right here. But yeah. you've been really hurt. You go through hurtful experiences. You've been put down and... and beaten and and yelled at and lost jobs and broken up with and loved ones have cancer and mm-hmm. and that scares you it hurts you know and i think i think the it's no one's fault you know it's no one's fault i think collectively we just are not resourced to to be with pain is the truth yeah. you know i we're just not resourced to 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 know how strong we are um to be with feeling to be Mm -hmm. with discomfort. So we do everything we can and we're taught to do everything we can to avoid it, to distract, to eat, to shop, to scroll, to to get away, go as far away from the pain as you can. But if your heart is hurting, that means you're leaving home. You know, you're you're fleeing the heart. You're, You're racing away from presence in order to try to access some sense of safety. And that is detrimental. That's going to land land you potentially, likely, in a place of feeling lost and without a sense of purpose, you know, disconnected and alone and struggling, yeah. suffering. Yeah. This, this phrase, no one's fault, what came up for me is the, the Catholic or Christian idea of original sin. And I was always very... Uh, hard on that topic, let's say I said, oh, this is, this is horrible. This idea that a baby is born with an original sin without doing anything, but maybe that's just part of the, that was just the best tools that 
people who made up Christianity had at, the, at their disposal at the time was to say, it's not anyone's fault. It's not the baby's fault. It's just the original sin that we're all born with as a way to kind of yeah make, make sense of the, the suffering and the pain that we, we all know in the world. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, what comes to me as you say that is um, also the possibility that we have so much ancestral trauma that we're just born mm -hmm. with shame. We're just born yep. with this debt to carry, you know, and and our parents didn't know how to figure it out and their parents didn't and their parents didn't. So we're just born with this old <laughs> stuff, you know, um, and maybe there's a way we can figure out how to not do that to future generations, you know? Maybe we can actually heal that sin, that shame, that burden, that feeling of wrongness inside of us. Yeah. Yeah. And in terms of the time frame of someone navigating these steps, like uh, it also evokes for me that the wheel of dependent origination in Buddhism, this the the cycle of chain of of causality. And when I first when I look at it, sometimes I say, okay, all of these chains they happen almost instantaneously. It's just like and it goes around. But in other experiences, like when we go from ignorance to craving to, you know, whatever it is, sometimes they can take, you know, minutes or hours or months. So uh, it seems like one never finishes this map. We're always kind of on it in some way, right? Yeah. yeah. I, I think that um, trauma is inevitable. Mm -hmm. You know, it's always going to be a part of our lives. Um, our loved ones are going to to be ill, we're going to experience death, we're going to experience accidents and um, neglect. It's, it's, it's going to be a part of our lives, but how we respond to that is something that we can implement change with. And I think that cycle of, of trauma and pain that we experience afterwards is very natural. You know, in a sense, we will be experiencing this again and again, but it's through this work, you know, I, I, through the map of, of the guidebook, you know, um, you see there that the, you go from home into the experience of trauma and the experience of trauma is something very natural. You know, we, we know the experience of trauma, we will experience it, we have, and we will again and again. Um, but how we respond to that, do we, do we need to go into avoidance? when we experience trauma, do we need to go into unconsciousness and separate ourselves? Do we have to avoid the pain or can we resource ourselves to change that trajectory and lean into awareness, you know, strengthen our ability to, to stay present, to observe what's happening, to feel, you know, we have to courageously feel the discomfort of the trauma in order to then work towards resolution. So, you know, I think that, that we will, um, be experiencing this again and again, but how we experience it, which route we take can be altered. And one route can lead us to um, suffering and one can lead us back home to the heart. And I also, you know, I also have it mapped out where, where consciousness plays a role, that when we are present, when we are in our hearts, when we are in a state of love and gratitude and, and getting our needs met and we feel um, held, we feel a sense of purpose, we feel at home in this world. There is an element of consciousness radiating from that. Um, but when we separate from that, when we go into avoidance, when we protect ourselves and fear uh, navigates our actions and our thoughts, then we're, we're pulled into unconsciousness. The, the ego is encased around us and we separate from that beautiful, pristine effervescence of presence, you know? And so it, it really is, as you say, like 
how long does it take to go through this process? When I'm guiding someone through the process, I do a four month I do a four month book course and I we spend one week on each stage. And for some people after four months, they've had complete transformation. They don't they're not addicted anymore. They have a different relationship with their estranged family member. They love their body like they never have. You know, they have real real breakthroughs. And for other people, they have gotten to the place where they realize they need to cry. You know, like even that to just, it may take four months for someone to have the realization that they want to cry, that they need it and they want it. You know, maybe their whole life they thought, I don't cry. Other people cry. I don't need to cry. I have other ways of processing my pain. I don't, I'm stronger than crying. And through this work, they realize, oh, wow, I have a lot more work to do. I, I think I'm just beginning the journey, you know, um, in which case it may take them years, years to work through the cycle. Ideally though, Michael, we can, like you said, with the, with the steps of Buddhism, we can program that into our beings. We can do the work, we can understand it so that when we're experiencing something painful, something traumatic, we don't automatically separate from presence and go into a fear state that drives us into protection and avoidance but we have learned, we've strengthened ourselves to remain present and to feel the pain and to breathe and to remain observant and to say, wow, I'm in a, wow, this is really shocking. It's, it's, I'm in a lot of pain right now. I'm grieving. I'm going to go and get a bath going and, and calm my nervous system. And I think I'm going to take it easy tonight and let myself rest. Maybe I'm going to write in my journal and be with the pain. I'm going to resource myself to resolve the pain, to resolve the trauma rather than what just happened. I don't know. I need a drink. Like that was too much for me. I got to get out of here. And then maybe it's three months before someone realizes, I think that might still be affecting me what happened three months ago. I haven't wanted to think about it. But in that case, the, the, the time that it takes to heal can, can be one day as opposed Mm -hmm. to six months, you know? Yeah, there's something in our culture, well, I'll just speak personally, there's something in me that wants to get to the resolution maybe quicker than I should. And I think it's from watching too many Hollywood movies where I'm like, okay, where's the happy ending? Let's get to it. So when I see this, I, I, I can envision myself wanting to rush towards realization. You know, I, I want to skip the first, the, the sort of wheel, the uh, protection, defense, suffering. I want to skip all that. I want to get right to realization. So how do you work with people who are in my boat of wanting to get to the ending before it's time? <laughs> well, actually what you just said would be ideal. You just your desire to to go from the experience to awareness would be ideal. That's that's what I try to help people understand is that we don't have to avoid it, that if we can be present with it. Um I would say what's more detrimental is if you wanted to shoot over to resolution without going through awareness. That that would be that would um, that might be an unconscious form of avoidance. Like, I don't have to observe it and feel it, but you know what? I'm just going to go and and uh, take care of myself by, um, you know, I'm, I'm just going to go for a run and I am getting my need for, for release met if I go running, but have you done the work of being with it? Have you really looked at it? Have you allowed yourself to feel it? You know, I think that's that might be a little more... Um, vulnerable territory if if we want to avoid awareness. But I would say that ideally, Michael, whatever you're tapping into right now, if I go through an experience and I want to, I want to jump over avoidance. I just want to go to awareness. I would say, heck yeah, do that because that would be really healthy. And I think you're wise and it would be really healthy to just say, I want to become aware of how I feel, what just happened. I want to look at it instead of turning away from it. And I want to process it. You know, but if if you're shooting too far ahead and you want to go straight to the happy ending <laughs> without being with the discomfort, you know, maybe it works for a little while. But what's so beautiful about about the phase of awareness, about doing the work of 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 realizing, of 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 being accountable for your for your participation in something, of of being observant and allowing yourself to feel, is that you actually gain courage, you gain strength and trust in yourself. You gain uh, power 
through doing that work of of not running away, but standing, but facing towards by by not saying I'm so afraid of pain that I need to keep pressing the eject but- button and running as far away as fast as I can, but saying I am strong enough to be here right now. I'm strong enough to be present. I'm strong enough to stay with this, to lean in instead of running away. And in doing so, you gain trust in yourself. You you gain trust in your ability to live, to process, to feel, to be alive in this human experience. And over time, that self-trust equates to confidence, self-confidence. You end up being less insecure. You end up being more secure, which security is safety. You feel safer in yourself. You feel more grounded. You feel you feel like you belong here and you don't need to apologize or tiptoe. You, you feel grounded and healed, you know, that the trauma is resolved and you feel at home in your body in this moment. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, well, I, I, I do recognize in myself that I will go to, let's say, solutions. Like if I'm in an argument with someone or someone's confronting me, I, I want to go to the, okay, how can we fix this? How can we get the Band-Aid out and fix this instead of staying with? Um, so I recognize, I do recognize that there is awareness, there is, um, there is an openness to feel it and to observe it, but I just I, I know in myself there's this tendency to jump to a solution before it's time. Yeah, I mean it's natural. It's natural to want to yeah. to jump to a solution, and I think that's one of your superpowers. You know that you have a desire, a drive inside of you for healing. That you want mm-hmm. to make things better. That you want resolution. You want the world to be a better place. You want to feel good. You know those are beautiful, radiant qualities of you, um, and. There's, there's also a very, very beautiful, sacred experience that happens when we allow ourselves to be present with something that is painful, that is uncomfortable. You know, it, um, kind of tying that back into us speaking about harmonization, you know, it, there is so much beauty in this world. There are so many beautiful sunsets and birds flying and mountains and and the natural world and and beautiful babies and mothers and just the most the eye-wateringly beautiful sacred experience of this world and there are hurricanes and there are deaths and there is illness and there are wars and there's so much pain happening as well but if we can allow ourselves and it and resource ourselves, equip ourselves to be present with it all, you know, we can then understand the landscape, this beautiful full spectrum of life experience that, that, that allows us to harmonize with the greater experience of life, which is not always feeling good. It's not always fixed and shiny and smiling. You know, it, sometimes it's dying and sometimes it's okay to harmonize with death. It's okay to be in that space and find, to listen to it, to not run away, but to, to lean in and listen to the wisdom of, of that pain, the wisdom of that grief, the, the, the truth, you know? And, it, and if, if and when we're able to do that, we become very, very powerful you know, our presence as humans, it, it goes from being destructive to being constructive. We end up being a stronger force. I, th- I think that we, we, we have such a larger capacity to hold the truth, to, to meet the truth, to harmonize with it, to, to understand it, and to collectively generate solutions, you know, rather than only looking at a small portion of what's happening and then feeling too scared and and too uncomfortable to feel everything you know the more that we that we shake hands with the discomfort with the the reality of of all of the pain we we end up being more able more ready to um to be a part of a greater solution you know the greater fixing
an awareness from the heart. So this is a bit maybe not counterintuitive, but it's not the, the you know people now are, are artificial intelligence is what's being discussed a lot in language and concepts and the thinking mind. How, when did when did the awareness of the heart come into play for you in your life? Hmm. You know, I I really feel that we all are born with awareness of the heart. I feel that it's it's a part of uh, of who we are. It's innate. It's it's part of our beings. It's it's integrated into the core of existence. Is the heart? You know, when we're born, you know, there is love. There's love between mother and child. There is tenderness. There's sensitivity. We're so sensitive. We're so open. We're, we feel. We're we're compassionate. Um, and so I I think that the awareness could also be um, related to the remembering you know mm -hmm. that it's not learning to to feel the heart but to remember to give our, to give you know speaking for myself to give myself permission to unfurl from those layers that were built up around me to protect me from all that I fear because I fear experiencing pain you know, because I experienced so much trauma as a child and I don't want to feel that again. So I'll just close up and protect myself. And when I do that, I separate myself from the power of that tenderness, from that awareness of, of that fertile landscape of love that is the truth of my being. Um, and for me, I always wanted it. I sang about it. I sang about love. I wrote about love. I spoke love, but but meanwhile, I was killing myself. I was beating myself up and abusing myself. And I was, I was so hungry. I was trying to fill something and I didn't know how to fill it. I chose food. I chose, you know, I was addicted. But it, you know, when I realized, you know, through my healing process that I was not bad and broken and that I didn't actually deserve to suffer, I think for many of us, when we've been through addiction when we've broken up with people because of our unruly emotions and when we've caused pain and when we've been too weak to heal ourselves so we've been stuck in this loop setting for so long we we don't know that we that we don't deserve to suffer we actually believe that we do deserve to suffer that we deserve to experience pain and we feel stuck there and when i realized whoa I actually am this tender being who doesn't actually deserve to suffer. I actually, there's an innocence there and I'm just doing my very best to try to, to try to take care of myself who, who's been hurting a long time and I'm just innocently trying to feed this, this wounded heart. You know, that compassion, that realization that I don't deserve to suffer, I'm actually very precious, you know. I think this huge weight was lifted and that's something that I try to, to help guide others with. That's the empowered heart work. You know, this whole methodology is very much geared towards helping people remember their, the true self within. Remember this beautiful, sacred, innocent presence that is the true heart of each of our beings, the spirit that's just having this temporary experience of life. You know, if we can remember who we really are, maybe we have to look past who we've become but if we can lean in even deeper to remember who we really are, we will have an awareness of the heart, you know, and it, and once we remember who we are, we're, we're halfway there. We're on our way home because now we've tapped into consciousness. Now we've tapped in, into the heart. Now we've made contact with our new destination rather than unconsciously running in fear and fleeing the pain. Now we've made contact with with the true destination, which is the home of the heart. And we can be guided there. We can take action to move back towards tenderness, towards consciousness and sensitivity, like we embodied when we were born, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think for a lot of people, Michael, um, they fear doing the work. They fear going within and looking at their childhood traumas. They fear peeling back the layers that have kept them safe and cozy for so long because they fear finding out the truth. And you'll ask them, what is it that you're afraid of? I'm afraid of, 
of really looking at what a bad, broken, disgusting, wrong person I am. That's I'm afraid of looking at the truth of who I really am. And my response is then you're not looking deep enough because that's not who you are. You're going to have to go deeper than that because you haven't gone in deep enough. If, you, if you've only gotten to the trauma, you haven't gone back far enough to the truth of who you are, which is that beautiful, tender heart. You know, you got to go deeper. So if someone says, I don't want to go to the depths of my being because I don't want to find out the truth of how wrong I am, then you got to go deeper. <laughs> you, haven't, you haven't gone deep enough, you know, because when you go th- to the true depths, you will come in contact with the true light. You know. Mm. So so much in there. I'm trying to <laughs> f- find the right thread to continue this energy. But uh, yeah, the remembering, the remembering that we deserve this. That's such a empowering phrase because it's something that I I know I forget. You know, I may remember it tonight, but I don't care about the Michael of tomorrow, (laughs) you know, like, so we do self-sabotage. We say, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to eat a whole pizza tonight because tonight it's going to feel good. I don't, I don't care about the the Michael of tomorrow. Um, so it's, it's just, it's, it's holding that map, that map of, of the next self, the next self, the, the, as all one person and all of those people deserve this freedom that, that you say that it's our birthright. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. If I, if I eat a whole pizza tonight, you know, if I even have that desire to eat an entire pizza, then chances are I'm not feeling Katie. I've mm-hmm. somehow I've desensitized because it would feel really good to eat a pizza. It would feel really good the the that warm the cheese, I just it would feel so good. I would I'd feel great for this hour or maybe even 30 minutes. Um but it means I'm not really deeply listening because deeper than, than that part of me that's craving a temporary comfort is a part of me that says, I want to thrive. I'm, I want to feel good. I want to feel healthy. I want to feel whole. And tomorrow, I want to be so close. I want to be so close to myself. I want to, I want to be the, the best friend that I need tomorrow. I don't want to have to apologize and regret and feel shame. You know, Mm. I want to be that friend right now that's going to make wise choices and be her best friend tomorrow and the next day. That's that's something I say a lot is we're learning to be our own best friend rather than a critic. We're learning to be that friend that's always there for you, that shows up, that understands you, that you can say anything to and won't judge you you know, that you can cry in front of and to be your own best friend, to really Um, hold yourself through life. Yeah. So you were talking about, I I, I don't think you use the word community, but I am curious to what extent community is a part of this healing process, being in community, whether it's support groups or friends, families. Yeah. A big part. It really Mm -hmm. is. It is and it isn't actually. I think there are two parts to it because Mm -hmm. in one sense, the the healing that we need will happen within us. The light that we're seeking will be found deep within us. You know, the the strength that we're seeking that we may be leaning on others for, the true strength in order to reach a place of being truly confident and healed and whole. It, I it's it is deep within each of us. I believe that, and I, I encourage people to find that strength within themselves. There's an element of independence in the healing process, in the self-healing process. And connection is a real thing. You know, for Mm -hmm. many of us, for most of us, our major traumas happened within interactions that that involved fellow humans. You know, our traumas, uh, the root system um, goes back to, to humans. So we may have learned, I'm not good enough. I don't deserve to be... Um, I don't, I'm not included. I don't deserve to be included. No one loves me. I'm not worthy, et cetera, et cetera, which are, you know, those are feelings and beliefs that many of us feel, whether we consciously realize it or not, where we are every day trying to pick ourselves up out of this belief system that there's something wrong, that we don't belong, that we're not good enough. And 
it's because we didn't receive the connection we needed. We didn't receive the the human interaction that was healthy, that was constructive, that was loving and, and comforting and encompassing. So to heal that wound, you know, I think community plays a very big part to know that I'm not alone, to know that I deserve to be included and that I am included. You know, I I um I offer different I offer a subscription, you know, through the Empowered Heart. It's a monthly subscription where people can be a part of a community. And it's not that I want to charge people to be a part of a community, but I have, um, I work with a lot of trained facilitators in the Empowered Heart Method that I've, you know, I spend four, five, six, seven, eight months, you know, working through every week through the material, through trainings to help facilitators be trained in the Empowered Heart Method. So together... We work together um, to have meetup groups. You know, someone, uh, Taryn has a meetup group on Beyond Alcohol and Tanya with Rising Up from Cannabis Dependency and I lead one uh, with Taryn on bulimia, healing from bulimia. And we're all offering these different meetup groups so that people have a place to go to to experience connection. Um, and that was created because it, because it is very real how much interaction and connection and community is an essential part of healing, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, So I think that in one sense, the work is your work as an individual. It's going to be your work to, to heal those wounds, to, to push through the avoidance and, and lean into awareness and, and observe, you know, it's going to be your work to feel that pain, to overcome that apprehension and that nervousness and go ahead and build a relationship with grief. And, when you do that in a group setting, when you do that, you know, with someone else, there is this beautiful, very necessary harmonization. There it comes in again, the harmonizing that happens when we come together um, that that is so such an essential part of our beings. You know, I don't think we're meant to be alone. Uh, the healing happens deep within the individual, but so much of the healing can happen and does happen when we come together, you know? Yeah. And when we show up for other people, you know, like that 12th step, that giving back to some, to help someone else who needs it, it's, it's the cycle. It's the end of the, yeah. and the beginning. <laughs> yeah. I think giving back is kind of symbolic of, I have healed myself enough to, to reach a place of, I've moved out of deprivation and now I'm in a place of abundance, mm. oh, you know? Yeah. Like now I have enough to give others because I'm not just scrambling and stretching my arms to, to get what my needs met because I I have my needs met and now I can help others, you know? Mm-hmm. And we un- unfurled, I used the word you used earlier, we unfurled the word heart. And so I'm wondering if you could do the same for uh, empowerment or empowered Mm-hmm. What does empowerment mean or how does yeah. empowered play a role? Yeah, I think because when we just look at these basic archetypal elements of fear and love, you know, if we just strip it down to fear and love, I often um, look at things in this, this um, light of does it resonate with the frequency of fear or does it resonate with the frequency mm-hmm. of love? You know, and is it consciousness or unconsciousness? And, and I, when we have experienced pain, you know, this work is very much geared towards helping people resolve trauma. So let's just mm-hmm. say trauma. Um, when someone experiences something painful, to whatever degree that pain may affect them, it, it may be some major trauma, but it's, I, I say, don't ever put trauma on a scale, you know. For someone losing a pet may be the most intense loss they've ever experienced in their life. And for someone else, they would, underestimate how much pain that causes someone. So we don't, Mm -hmm. we can't rate trauma, but we experience this intense pain, each of us again and again. And it's it's scary. Pain is scary to experience. Fight or flight, cortisol, you know, we are designed to, to not be in pain, to not want to feel pain. You know, we're designed to avoid pain um, to a certain degree, physically, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But when we, when we allow that fear to navigate our actions and our thoughts, when that fear takes over and, you know, tying back to what we were saying earlier, we run away. We're separating ourselves from presence. 
we got to distract ourselves. We've, I've got to get out of here. You know, I have to get out of this moment. I have to get out of my body. I have to, to go anywhere. But here, fear is what is, what is my motivation. It's pushing me. So I'm, I'm running and I'm fleeing. If I'm running and I'm fleeing, I'm not empowered. I am being moved by fear. So I'm scared and I'm not present. I'm, I don't feel resourced. I don't feel strong enough. I have to keep reaching for something outside of myself because I don't feel like I'm strong enough to handle it. You know, so that if that happens year after year, whether you realize it or not, there's very little trust in your own strength. There's very little trust in your ability to be present regardless of what the experience is, regardless of how painful or uncomfortable it is. You don't feel strong enough. And for many of us, we may put on this facade of confidence. You know, I make a lot of money. I have a lot of followers. I'm very beautiful. I, I have this successful marriage. I have whatever it is. You know, we find these, these temporary means of, of experiencing confidence. But the reality is fear is motivating us. Fear is what is operating our systems. So when you do this work of, of being present regardless, of, of observing, of feeling, of, of of allowing awareness to infuse your being rather than unconsciousness and avoidance, you really do gain strength. You gain courage. You gain courage to be alive. You know, you gain courage to be present, to show up for life, to show up for others, to show up for yourself, to be a better listener. And in doing so, you become more powerful you, you start tapping into a greater essence of power. And I don't mean power like a strong arm. I don't mean power like the CEO of a company. I mean power like power. I'm powerful enough to have been a caregiver for my mom with dementia for nine years. Like that took so much power to do that. You know, and I don't think I would have been a caregiver for her for so long if I hadn't done the most incredible work of healing myself from addiction because that allowed me to be resourced in being able to take care of Katie, to listen to Katie's needs while I took care of her. You know, I spent many years as a caregiver and that required power. That required, mm -hmm. that required wisdom. It required patience. It required an intuition to be able to communicate with someone who couldn't speak and to, to be confident enough to not run away, you know, to say I'm strong enough to do this and it's sad and it's so painful and it's gruesome, but I'm strong enough for this. I can, I'm powerful enough to be here and I know how to make sure that Katie doesn't get washed away in the experience. I can take care of her too. And that is, I, when I think of, of that, someone caregiving for showing love, you know, to themselves and others and being able to help care for those around them, like, I see the strongest, most sacred arms. You know, I see this, a being who is really stepping into their power, into their purpose. Um, and my greatest wish in this work, my greatest desire is to help people find power in themselves. Mm -hmm. Because when you do find that power, you know, let's imagine, Michael, that you have this book in you that you want to write and you've wanted to write it for, for years. You know, you... You're very wise, you're a caregiver, you're a musician, you know, you, you have all these skills and this wisdom and you want to write this book, but still there's a bit of insecurity, there's a bit of, you know, second guessing yourself, imposter complex, whatever it is, you're afraid. Mm -hmm. Well, that fear is pulling you off your course, it's pulling you off your purpose path, you know, it's, it's, it's a it's a distraction and a detour from you being directly connected and aligned with why you came to this planet. So if you're able to understand why you're afraid, if you're able to, to truly show up for yourself and say, wow, Michael doesn't need to be afraid, you know, regardless of how it's received, I'm going to love him regardless. And, and I trust the spirit moving through me and I trust myself and I love myself, you know, I'm going to put this work out into the world and I'm going to do it. It's going to require your confidence in order to do that. You're going to have to be, you're going to have to come from a place of love and trust instead of fear, you know, and that's, that is confidence. That's power for you to step forward on your purpose path and do the courageous work that you know is, is calling to you from deep within you. 
that's the kind of power I want to help awaken in people because the ultimate bigger goal here is not just to resolve trauma in, in humans and in individuals, but it's to realign us with that remembrance for why we're here, to realign us with direct contact with consciousness and the awareness that this earth needs our help, that we are meant to heal ourselves so that we have stronger arms to help, to help the planet to be aware, to be better listeners, to be more proactive and to have the confidence to be a part of the conversation, confidence to, to be a part of the solution. You know, that, that's what my dream is with this work is to help people heal themselves so that they're not hiding, you know, they're not dimly lit off in the corner, but they're burning bright and they're on the front lines and they're writing a book and they're putting the work out to the world. They're, they're launching Conference, conferences and podcasts and, and speaking up for the power of consciousness and love. You know, that, that's the bigger goal with this work is that we, we stop, not that we stop, but we heal the suffering. We transmute that into the strength we need because we need that energy. We need that, all of that life force energy that's just draining out into our pain. We need to utilize that for a solution, you know. That's the bigger work. Hmm. Wow. I can't think of a better way to end this conversation. So I have to just say, <laughs> wow. <laughs> <sighs> yeah. Uh, thank you so much. The new book, uh, it's going to be, I think it's going to be big. We're going to, we'll have links to the book in the show notes so people can download it in digital and physical form, right? It'll be both. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Wow, thank you, Katie, so much. This has been a, a journey for me. It's it's been you've tapped into so many things that we I think we could go on for more hours, but I want to be mindful of your time. <laughs> yeah, I I feel like this is a, a good four hour interview that <laughs> we can just be here and experience what we just experienced. And and I'm just grateful for everyone for tuning in and for being a part of the sand community. This is such a special, radiant community. And I'm honored to be a part of it and I'm just grateful we have one another that we're working together to amplify the messages, the downloads, the the information that's coming through each of us and working together to get that out into the world, you know. Many thanks. Yeah. Many thanks to you too. You're really wonderful. You're an incredible interviewer and and it's been really enjoyable to be here with you. Thank you. Yeah, it's been great harmonizing with you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll yeah. say goodbye. Good no, just <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> thank you, Michael. And thank you for listening to The Sounds of Sand. We invite you to explore more of our talks, dialogues, videos, articles, events, and offerings through our website, scienceandnonduality.com. If you've enjoyed this conversation, please consider becoming a member to access our massive library of SAND content, available exclusively to SAND members. And we would love it if you could leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Google, and Spotify, and share this episode with your family, friends, and all sentient beings. Be well. <laughs>